Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Learn Physics, the show where I explain graduate level physics textbooks to curious minds like you. Today we'll be continuing our journey through classical mechanics by Goldstein and collaborators with chapter 4, Rigid Body Kinematics. So far we've talked about the physics of particles, that is objects of zero size. Everyday life, as we know, is made of objects that have size, like this camera charger, and this pen, and this eraser. So how do we extend the physics of point particles into the realm of finite size objects? The answer is we treat them as collections of point particles with certain particular constraints. And the constraints are the distances between any pair of particles has to always remain the same. With modern science, we know that matter is made of atoms, so this model is mostly true, uh, with a big asterisk for quantum physics. But even if we didn't know matter was made of atoms, the model would still work for objects with size. This chapter is completely devoted to representing the position and orientation of objects. The topics of this chapter include transformation matrices, Euler angles, finite and infinitesimal rotations, and the Coriolis effect. And although this is a math-heavy chapter, the concepts are rather simple. So I'll treat this like I've treated all the other chapters. I'll focus on the concepts, but show the math so that you can follow along if you desire. All right, let's get started with section 4.1, the independent coordinates of a rigid body. A rigid object has six degrees of freedom. It can move left, right, up, down, forward, backward, and it can rotate around three axes. Recalling chapter one, this means it requires six coordinates to represent its position state. We'll be talking in particular about two coordinate systems. The space coordinate system, which would be like a fixed coordinate system that the object moves and rotates relative to, and the body coordinate system, which would be a set of axes fixed to the object, which move and rotate with the object. The question of the chapter is, how do we transform between these coordinate systems? The position transformation is easy. Just subtract the x, y, z from the object. For a rotation, it gets difficult. There's no obvious set of coordinates that can define the orientation of an object. But throughout the years, models have been developed. The first model we talk about is the direction cosines. That is, all the angles between the space coordinate axes and the body coordinate axes. There are nine of these, one for each x, y, z going to each x, y, z prime. The transformation of a point into rotated coordinates looks like this. And I know that's a lot, but I wrote it all out for a reason. Now something might jump out at you here. We talked about how we only need three coordinates to describe a rotation, but here we have nine. What gives? Well, the axes are orthogonal which means between the x, y, and z, there are 90 degree angles. This can be accounted for by using this equation, which is a summation of multiplying the cosines together, and that symbol that it equals is the Kronecker delta. If the indices in the delta are the same, it equals one, but if those indices are different, it equals zero. And this gives us enough constraints to limit the number of independent variables to three which we won't label yet, but we will when we get to the section on Euler angles. Section 4.2 is titled Orthogonal Transformations. An orthogonal transformation is what we've been talking about. We take a coordinate system, we move it in space, and we rotate it. There is no scaling of the axes, there is no changing of the angle between them. Now the reason I wrote these entire equations out is because there is a much easier way to represent sets of equations that look similar like this. That is to use a matrix. Each of these angles has number indices on it. In math, we label those with letters. So we don't have to write out all nine of these every single time, we can simply write theta ij. Next, we notice that for every angle, we take the cosine of it. So we simplify it by, instead of writing all this, we just write aij. The book then introduces a math notation called Einstein summation notation. And this is math, 
but it's very, very common in physics, so it's worth bringing up now. When we have a sum of two things multiplied together with indices, we notice that the index we sum over is repeated in the two objects. Therefore, we just cut off the sum. We don't write it. And when we have two objects multiplied together with a repeated index, it just means sum over that index. And when the sum of aij, aik equals the Kronecker delta, that is called an orthogonal transformation. Whew, that was a lot of math. Well, don't worry, because if you forget it, that's totally fine. There will not be a test. Next, we can put all the aijs into a matrix, call it capital A, and now we can take that giant set of equations that we wrote and compactify it to look like this. The x vector represents the space coordinates. The x prime vector represents the body coordinates. And the A matrix is the transformation between them. In this equation, A is not a number, it is considered to be an operator, which is a word we will hear a lot from now on. An operator is something you can add to a math object to transform it into another math object. It's kind of like a function, which is something you can put a number into and get another number. If we use the orthogonal transformation operator to represent a vector moving and rotating in a coordinate system, that's called an active transformation. If we use it to represent a change in the coordinate system, it is called a passive transformation. There's a simple and common example of using this to just rotate one set of axes in two dimensions. The transformation matrix looks like this, which you might have seen if you're a STEM major. It comes up all over the place in physics, computer science, and probably elsewhere. It's a representation of a vector rotated in a coordinate system or a rotation in the coordinate system. Section 4.3 is properties of the transformation matrix. Now this section is pretty math heavy, but it talks about basic properties of matrices which will be convenient to know. The first thing about matrices is that the order of operations matters. A times B does not equal B times A. We can see this if we think about rotation matrices. If our two rotations are left and down, then going left down gives us a different result than going down left. They are associative, however. So you can do matrix operators left to right or right to left. There is a unit matrix represented by a one where if you multiply any matrix by it, you get the same matrix back. From this, we can define the inverse of a matrix. A matrix times its inverse equals the unit matrix. The transpose of a matrix switches the rows and columns. The inverse of an orthogonal matrix is its transpose, which is super convenient. If a matrix is equal to its transpose, it's called symmetric. If a matrix is equal to the negative of its transpose, it's called skew symmetric. Now suppose we want to represent the same transformation in a different basis. Okay, what does that mean? For example, we might want to represent the rotation of a vector in the space coordinates or that same rotation of a vector in the body coordinates. In the space coordinates, that transformation is called A, and in the body coordinates, that transformation would be called A prime. If A is the rotation in the space coordinates, and B is the rotation between the space coordinates and the body coordinates, then with the help of a bunch of algebra, we can find an expression for A prime in terms of A and B. And it looks like this. This might seem like random information, but I assure you it comes up later, especially in quantum mechanics. The determinant of a matrix is a number value that represents it. If you wanna know how to calculate a determinant, it's pretty easy to look up, so we'll skip it here. For orthogonal matrices, the determinant of the transpose times the determinant of the matrix is equal to one. And we represent that as the determinant of the matrix squared, which will again come up in quantum mechanics. This means the determinant of the matrix by itself is either plus one or minus one. If it's minus one, that means there's a reflection in the transformation. It is called improper and it doesn't happen in real life motion. If the determinant is plus one, that's called a proper transformation, and there is no reflection. And finally, the determinant of an orthogonal transformation is the same regardless of what basis it's in. 
Section 4.4 is about the Euler angles. Now finally we get three coordinates for our rotations. The Euler angles are of course named after the mathematician whom half of all of math is named after. They're all about rotating axes in sequence. In an XYZ coordinate system, first we talk about rotating around the Z axis, then we talk about rotating around the new X axis, then we rotate again about the new Z axis. And there we have it, three angles to rotate our coordinates to any new orientation. And yes, I am aware of the cultural significance of what this looks like. Interestingly, sometimes vehicles such as airplanes will use a different set of Euler angles. They'll talk about the pitch, yaw, and roll. These are convenient when we like the direction of up to generally remain about the same direction. Section 4.5 is about the Cayley-Klein parameters which I'm not going to show because the math is extremely convoluted, but I imagine it's really convenient if you're actually doing the calculations. They use imaginary numbers with constraints to get proper orthogonal matrices. Section 4.6 is Euler's theorem of rigid body motion. It says that if one point is fixed, any displacement of a rigid body is a rotation about some axis passing through the fixed point. This means there always exists a vector that when transformed equals itself. This vector is called an eigenvector, and it has an eigenvalue of 1 because the result is itself multiplied by 1. The chapter then goes through a discussion of how to do calculations with eigenvectors and eigenvalues, which we'll skip for this video. It ends with Chazel's theorem, which says the most general displacement of a rigid body is a translation plus a rotation. Section 4.7 is finite rotations, in contrast with infinitesimal, not infinite, because infinite rotations doesn't make sense. This chapter describes a vector rotating about the previously described axis vector, which in this section is labeled n. It derives a formula for the rotation, which is this. Phi is the angle rotated about the axis, and there's a dot product and a cross product in there, which makes sense if you really think about it. This rotation angle can be expressed in terms of the Euler angles using this equation. I don't have too much more to say about this. It was a pretty mathy section. Section 4.8 is about infinitesimal rotations, meaning very small rotations. Why do we want to know about infinitesimal rotations? Well, because they are motion, and infinitesimal motion lets us talk about velocity. In infinitesimal rotations, switching the order of rotations gives us about the same result. Unlike large rotations where, for instance, left down is different from down left, infinitesimal rotations might give us a left down and a down left that are almost exactly the same. So we can approximate that the transformation AB is equal to the transformation BA. When rotating a vector, the infinitesimal change in the vector is equal to the vector cross product the infinitesimal rotation. Vectors that transform this way are called polar vectors. The infinitesimal rotation is equal to n times d angle, which means the infinitesimal vector change is equal to this. Speaking of cross products, the chapter uses this section to introduce another matrix idea called the levi civita symbol. I think I pronounced that right. We've talked about matrices which have two indices. The levi civita symbol has three which means it's like a matrix, but it's three-dimensional. Drawn out, it would look like this. And it's sometimes used to represent the cross product if we use index notation and Einstein summation notation. It means if the numbers cycle one, two, three, it's plus one. If they cycle three, two, one, it's minus one. And if any two indices are the same, it's zero. Section 4.9 is the rate of change of a vector. Now we all know that the rate of change of something is its velocity. It is the derivative of the position over time. So to switch coordinates between the space frame and the body frame when measuring the motion of a vector, the motion of the vector in the space frame is equal to the motion in the body frame plus the motion due to rotation. Think of an asteroid moving through space. We can represent its motion relative to the sun 
or we can represent its motion relative to how we see it standing on a spinning earth. The sun would be the space frame and the earth would be the body frame. In the space frame, it seems like it's simply going in a straight line. In the body frame, it seems like it is spinning around us. And the apparent motion due to rotation can be represented by this equation, where that omega is the angular velocity of the rotation. Since g could be any vector, we can take it out of the equation and talk about the operator. We write it like this, with the derivatives just sitting there by themselves. Because remember, an operator is something we can slot an object like a vector into. The section spends some time representing the components of omega in terms of the Euler angles, but I didn't think the equations were relevant enough to present them here. The direction of omega is perpendicular to the rotation according to the right-hand rule. If an object is rotating in the direction your fingers curl, omega points in the direction of your thumb. And it has to be your right hand. If you use your left hand, it's backwards. And finally, section 410 is on the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect, like the centrifugal force, is a fictitious force objects can experience in rotating reference frames. Starting with the idea that the velocity is the derivative of position, the position is the derivative of acceleration, we can do some algebra and use the fact that the net force is equal to an object's mass times its acceleration to get an expression for the effective force in a rotating reference frame. The term on the left points outward and it is the centrifugal force. The term in the middle depends on the velocity and that is the Coriolis effect which is occasionally called the Coriolis force, being a fictitious force like the centrifugal force. So for instance, if our object is rotating this way with an upward omega and a counterclockwise rotation, an object traveling in the horizontal plane will experience a clockwise force. An object traveling vertical will experience no force. This is why on Earth, hurricanes in the northern hemisphere rotate clockwise and hurricanes in the southern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise because in the northern hemisphere, the angular velocity points out of the ground, and in the southern hemisphere, the angular velocity points into the ground. There is a great visualization of this effect in the video game Outer Wilds, which it's so good that I am gonna spoil a little bit of the DLC. Not to be confused with Outer Worlds, which is a completely different game, Outer Wilds is a game about science and space exploration, and it is one of my favorite games of all time. Definitely recommend it to anyone who watches this channel. So if you have any inkling that you might play Outer Wilds anytime in the future, skip ahead to the timestamp on screen. If you are just not the kind of person who plays video games, or if you don't care about spoilers, then go ahead and watch this example. You ready? Here we go. This is a ring world. It spins for artificial gravity. And that was chapter four of Classical Mechanics by Goldstein and collaborators. Today, we learned how to represent a rigid object that can move and rotate. We talked about transforming coordinates and the transformation matrix. We talked about the Euler angles, we talked about finite and infinitesimal rotations. We talked about the velocity of objects in rotating reference frames. And we talked about the Coriolis effect. Next time, we'll look at chapter five, rigid body equations of motion. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments and don't forget to like. And if you think this kind of analysis is valuable, you can support me on Patreon like these people. Thanks again. See you next time.